Turn with me to uh, Psalm 119 once again as we continue through this wonderful psalm about the greatness of God's Word, which correlates with the greatness of God. Uh, we, uh, we sometimes forget how great the God is that we serve and how wonderful that God is. We take for granted very often what God does for us. We take for granted His words very often. And today I want us to remember the the correctness of God's Word. There are many today who would say this is an old, dusty book. It's not new. Back in the 1950s, there began to be, actually before that at the turn of the last century, in the early 1900s, there were some German theologians. They came up with something called the critical theory. And they began to pick apart passages of the Bible and somehow try to tell us that some things were right and some things were wrong and some things you could believe and other things you couldn't believe. As a matter of fact, Thomas Jefferson was one who decided that some passages he just didn't like. He didn't think they were right. And he took a knife and he would, as he read through the Bible, he would take his knife and he would cut out spots cut out passages you know I don't understand uh, his, his logic there and, and I respect him but when you cut out on this page you cut out on this page and you might have liked what you saw on this page but this page you cut it out so I think he finally began to realize that and he wrote his own Bible called the Jefferson Bible it's a lot smaller than the one we have but in that time where the German theologians began to say, you can't trust every word of the Bible. It, it, all of it's just not true. All of it is, is something you can't trust. You've got to pick and choose what is really true. And, and that began to permeate quietly in the places of education. Primarily the, the learned of our nation, the, the so-called intelligentsia. And they began to write books, and, and it didn't hit Southern Baptists very early until the 50s. And there was a, a fellow by the name of Ralph Elliott. He was, was a professor at Mid-America Seminary out in Kansas City, and he wrote a book about the first 11 chapters of Genesis and said, basically, that's a myth. There were four different writers actually three writers and one Deuteronomist, which means a compiler. And they made themselves, each writer made themselves look good. The priest wrote it so that the priest would look good. The uh, scribe wrote it so the scribe would look good. The prophet wrote it so the prophet would look good. And the Deuteronomist went together and he put it all together. That's a very simplified version of what he said. But he said that Adam and Eve weren't real persons. They were just symbolic of, of people on earth. And there was a great outcry, great uproar. And so, Southern Baptist Convention leadership apologized and said, I'm sorry, we won't do that again. But within the seminaries and in the most colleges, there began to foment this idea that you can't trust the whole Bible. It's not all correct. And I would share with you one of the best ways when somebody says to you, aren't there errors in the Bible? Has anybody ever said to you, I think there's some errors in the Bible? Anybody ever heard that? You know, I, I've learned the best way to talk to them is to say, well, I've read through it several times. I've never seen them. Where are they? Do you realize that 99.9% .9 of the people can't show you what they think is an error? It's amazing how they begin to babble and say, well, I, uh, well, aren't there, uh, d d d you, are you sure? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm asking you. You're the one that said it's an error. You see, most people haven't read the whole Bible. I don't want to embarrass you, but I dare say there's some of you who have not read cover to cover the Bible. But there are no errors in the Bible. And back in the, it started earlier, but in the 90s, there was what was called, actually in the late 70s it started in our convention and it was the battle for the Bible's 
truthfulness. Now, the Bible's always been there. It's never changed, but people began to believe it didn't bring truth. And so when there was this time of, of, of uh, conflict, and even to this day, there are folks that would say, I will not call this book inerrant and infallible. But Southern Baptists began to change our seminaries. Now our seminaries are places where the Bible is revered. It's not worshipped, but it's revered because it's God's Word. And the psalmist is saying that today, that the Bible is correct because it comes from a correct God. It's perfect because it comes from a perfect God. The perfect God cannot make something imperfect. So if you turn to Psalm 119, and we're going to begin in verse 137. Once you have found that, if you would, please stand as we honor the reading of this inerrant, infallible word. Beginning in one, verse 137, the Bible says, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. Your testimonies, which you have commanded, are righteous and very faithful. My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. Your word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. I am small and despised, yet I do not forget your precepts. Your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delight. The righteousness of your testimonies is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Father, as we stand before you, Father, give us your testimonies. Give us your word. Give us understanding that we might live. And Father, I ask you again to speak to the heart of everyone's here. Not, not what I say is important, but what you say to them while I'm preaching. That they might hear your voice and obey. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God is righteous. That's the, the first thing. Verses 137 and 138. It's clear. The psalmist is saying, God is righteous. And if God is righteous, we can depend, we can depend on his word. Uh, I was in the middle of, of that time period that the Southern Baptist Convention changed from a very left-leaning liberal organization to a holy, Bible-believing, inspiring denomination now there was never a time where there weren't bible believing southern baptist there'll never be a time where there's not people who do not believe the bible that are southern baptist you can call yourself southern baptist doesn't make you anything particular you can call yourself anything you want to you can call yourself a car and live in a garage but you're still not a car and the bible is true and over those those periods of time there was great conflict do you realize that our ethics committee of the Southern Baptist Convention in the early 70s, actually 74 and 75, agreed with Roe v. Wade? And they said, we have to give a woman her choice to kill that baby in the womb. They were just fundamentally wrong because they didn't trust what God had written. But the psalmist says, that's not the case. We need to, to understand and understand not only that God's word is true, but that we have to obey it, his precepts. Psalm 145, 17 says, The Lord is righteous in all his ways, gracious in all his works. The prophet Ezra, writing chapter 9, verse 15, says, O Lord God of Israel, you are righteous, for we are left as a remnant. As it is this day, here we are before you in our guilt, though no man can stand before you because of this. No man can stand before God because of our unrighteousness and his righteousness. If we stand before him and begin to talk about how righteous we are and how what we believe is right and what someone else believes is wrong, we need to go to the Bible and say, God, what do you believe is right? Because his right righteousness is the only righteousness that really matters. 
No matter who you are, no matter how smart you are, no matter how astute you are in every, every area of your life, if you don't believe what God says, then you're not as bright as you think you are. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 is a reminder of who we are. He says, my little children, he's speaking to us, to Christians. Things, these things I write to you that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. John is saying, listen, we don't want you to sin. It can't be a habit. It can't be habitual. It can't be ongoing all the time. But when you sin, and, and that's, that's the case for all of us, we will sin. When we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. I love this verse because in my mind, I'm thinking when, when I mess up, and I do, just like you, you and I have that in common, Satan is up there accusing now, he accused Job, and Job was as good as, as anybody has been throughout the ages. He trusted God. And while Job certainly wasn't perfect, no one was except Jesus. When Satan went to him, God said, test him. Now, he had a, set a limit to how much Satan could test him, but he turned him loose on Job. And the reality is we've got to understand that we have that advocate. Now, because Jesus died on the cross, when Satan accuses us, no matter how bad we are, when Satan accuses us, and sometimes, rightly, Jesus steps up and said, Father, that may be right, and it is right, but you recall, I paid for it on the cross. Now, God the Father doesn't forget that, but the reality is Jesus paid our penalty. He paid a debt that we owe. 138 says, your word is righteous. And in Lamentations 3, verses 22 and 23 says, through the Lord's mercy, we are not consumed because his compassion fails not. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. Think about that. If, if, we were de if it, our salvation was dependent upon how we lived, and how good we lived and how good we were. If the Bible said that if you sin, you die, this would be an empty building. Matter of fact, this, this building would not exist. But because of the mercy of God, we're not consumed. Our sin is not consumed. And folks, Jesus paid a price for us to not be consumed. Henry Blackaby made a statement one time, and at first I thought, man, that's, that's kind of harsh. But he said, you know, a lot of people are walking around fearing Satan. They're always talking about Satan, and we've got to be careful around Satan. We've got to stand up against Satan. He said, but listen, let me remind you of something. Satan has not been able to kill anybody, but God has. Do you remember out in the, the wilderness? When a group stood up and said, Moses, we don't care about you. We don't care about your God. We're going to do what we want to do. And we're going to withstand against you. And God opened the earth up and swallowed them up all at one time. It was over. Because of Jesus, he doesn't consume us like that. In verse 139, we have to have a response. 139 says, My zeal has consumed me because my enemies have forgotten your words. What sometimes seems like zeal, some, sometimes seems like we're overzealous, is because the evil one has attacked us. The evil one has made it seem like that we're wrong. We're Confused of being homophobic because we believe in one man, one woman is marriage. We're, we're accused of, of so many things because we believe what the Bible says. That's what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, I'm getting stronger and stronger in my belief. 
because those enemies who have attacked me. I remember early in seminary, I had professors who did not believe the inerrant and infallible word. I was looked down on. Not only for that, but also because I wasn't all that good a student. You, you, you understand, I came into ministry 30 years ago with no real theological education. All I knew was, this is the word that I believe. And everywhere I read it, I believed it. And I, I believed it was true. And, and I was confident it was true. But one of the great things about being in a class where you're challenged is, and when you are stubborn like I am, I would go home sometimes and study a lot harder because I want to make sure that what I believe this word said was right. And I believe I became a stronger advocate for God the Father by spending time in his word challenging those who said it's not right. Now that did not make me the most popular student in some of those professors' classes. But I can tell you I talked to some of those professors later, some I disagreed with. And to this day, those who are still alive would say, yeah, he wasn't the brightest bulb in the class. He wasn't the sharpest knife in the drawer. But he believed what he believed. That's what the psalmist is saying. The psalmist is saying, listen, I may not be as smart as these guys, but I can tell you this. I believe what God's Word says. John 2, verses 12 through 17 says about Jesus. Says, and now the Passover of the Jews was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those who sold oxen and sheep and doves and the money changers doing business. When he had, a, when he had made a quip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen and poured out the money changers' money, and overturned the tables. And he said to those who sold doves, Take those things away. Do not make my father's house a house of merchandise. Then his disciples remembered that it is written, Zeal for your house has eaten me up. That's a quote from Psalm 69.9. Folks, Jesus had zeal. And he was passionate. And he drove the money changers out. Now you understand he was not just angry what they were, for what they were doing, except what they were doing was not good, but worse than that, the way they were doing it. If you came into town and you were from Assyria, let's say, and you wanted to come and worship the one true God, you wanted to make a sacrifice, and you brought the very best lamb that you had, and it was virtually spotless, but those in the, that sold the animals would take that lamb and they'd go over it and they'd say, oh, wait a minute, there's a, mm, there is a pimple right here on the shoulder of this lamb. Oh, that's not good enough. You can't bring a pimple in here on, on a, a ram. But now we've got this one over here that has a little spot, but this spot doesn't count as bad. So you can use this one. Now, the difference in the two sheep may have been $100. That's how they made their money. Because, you see, someone had brought that sheep in, and they said, oh, no, 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 you can't use that one. We've got one over here with a little pimple that doesn't really count. They were just deceiving the people. They were taking advantage of people, and then when they changed money, they would say, well, you can't give an offering from your money. That, that money is foreign money. God doesn't accept foreign money. And so they were taking the money, and, and it's kind of like when you go into a foreign country. You, you exchange your money, and let's say the money, their money is 200 of those for 100 of yours. You take $100, and they'll give you 200 But when you get ready to sell it back to them, you don't use it all. It's the opposite. They may say, well, yeah, that's, that, that's not right. Our money is worth 220 for your 100. So therefore, we're going to give you 80 for that 200. You see, the key thing here is they were cheating people. They were making it a merchandise place. They were making it a place kind of like a flea market 
where you can buy and sell, and the only person making money is the person with the merchandise. I often marvel when we had conventions in Atlantic City. I always amazed me how people would go in there, look at those buildings, look at the trappings, look at the expense of those buildings, and say, I'm on a gamble. Folks, it's not a gamble. I remember saying to some of my colleagues, that's not a gamble. You're not gambling. Oh, yes, we are. No, you're not. Look around you. You think they built this by being fair? It's not fair. But the reality is, that's what Jesus saw there, and Jesus was zealous. You know, we have this <clears throat> mentality in some areas. People say, well, you Christians just don't act like Jesus. You, you, you say you believe God's Word, and, and you preach it, and you preach it strongly, and you preach it loudly, and you maybe get on street corners and preach it. Jesus would never have done that. Yes, he was. Jesus was powerful in what he did. Acts 17, 16, <clears throat> Paul is writing, and he says, excuse me, not Paul, but Paul was waiting in Athens. He said, now while Paul waited for them in Athens, his spirit was provoked within him when he saw that the city was given over to idols. Folks, we ought to get angry about those things that are wrong in our country. We ought to be willing to stand up for whatever, and, and whatever happens to us. There's a, a preacher in, in uh, Charlotte that stands on corners, and he shouts. And from what I understand, from three blocks away, you can hear him, and he doesn't have a megaphone. And it's legal for him to do that because he doesn't need any artificial megaphones or uh, loudspeakers he can be heard and his number one thing is repent and be converted jesus saves he has a booming voice people don't like him because he says jesus saves well, i'm gonna ask you does that bother you doesn't bother me because i already know that but it bothers people who'd want to deny that God is God. They want to deny God's Word. Paul was zealous. Jesus was zealous. We ought to be zealous in what we say and do. Because there's a revelation here in verse 140. 140 says, Your Word is very pure. Therefore, your servant loves it. We've got to look at therefore. Why is that therefore, therefore? It's because your word is pure. The word, this word, this book has been challenged more than any book ever. It's been tested. It's been attacked. Do you want to know something? It has always emerged pure and undefiled. Do you know why? Because when the heat comes, the gold rises to the top. When the heat comes, the impurities or the dross is pushed off. When the heat comes, it's pure. It makes things pure. Heat will purify a lot of things. One of the things, if you have water that's bad, you want to purify it the easiest way? Build you a fire and heat it up so many degrees, a certain period of time, come to a ro rolling boil, let it cool off, and it's good water. Heat purifies the Bible is pure, and it shows it's pure because it withstands the heat. Now, <clears throat> verse 141 reminds us that we must have some reflection. I'm small and insignificant. Ever thought about that? Do you, have you ever really thought how small we are in the scheme of things, the world scheme of things? In this universe, this incredibly vast universe, we are very small. We're, we're actually smaller in the regard to this whole universe than an ant is that runs across your sidewalk is to this country. Small and insignificant in reality. Can you imagine why God 
would come down and die for somebody as so small and insignificant as I am, as you are, with all due respect. 1 Corinthians 15, 9 says, For I am the least of the apostles, who am not worthy to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of Christ. That's what Paul said to the church at Corinth. And if Paul said, I'm the least, why are y'all arguing over in Corinth about who's the greatest? Paul said, I'm the least. In Ephesians, he wrote to the Ephesian church. He said, to me, who am less than the least of all saints, this grace was given, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Here it says in verse 41, yet... I do not forget your precepts. You see, we're insignificant in, a, in a many, many ways. <clears throat> Even that group that says there's going to be 144,000 people in heaven, that's all. The reality is one in 144,000 is not too many, is it? We sometimes get to thinking we're somebody special. The, the, the psalmist here wants to remind us that we need to, <clears throat> need to understand that we sometimes get too big for our britches. That's what I was told when I was a child, <clears throat> when I got out of line. And that's where I got corrected in my britches. The reality is, in the scheme of the whole universe, we're small and insignificant, and our God is great because he made that whole universe. And there's a reasonable to this, reasonableness to this. Verse 42 answers back to, to verse 141. It said, your righteousness is as everlasting righteousness, and your law is truth. Now notice, he says your law is truth. This is the written word. Jesus was the living word. And what did Jesus say that he was? I am the way, the what? He didn't say, I speak truth. He didn't say, I know truth. He didn't say, I can guide you to truth. He says, I am truth. And that's forever. That's not, I am truth today, maybe not tomorrow. I was truth last year, but maybe today, maybe not tomorrow. I am truth. It is ongoing. It continues. It started before time began and will end never. I am truth truth and your word is truth why in the world do we get so enamored with earthly treasure that will be gone do you realize that <clears throat> not a one of us here in 200 years will have a bank account anybody think you'll have a bank account in 200 years anybody think you'll care no that's treasure on earth that people work for, save for, invest for, do everything they can to keep that they're going to die and leave and leave it to somebody who may work for it and save it and keep it, and they may keep it for several generations. Even these big farms that people continue to farm, and it's like, it's like that's what they worship. But sooner or later, for them, it'll be gone. The only thing that's going to be eternal is God's Word and God Himself. And thus, if we surrender to Him. Now, that's reasonable to believe. But there's some restriction here. Verse 143 says, Trouble and anguish have overtaken me. Trouble and anguish have overtaken me. Yet, your commandments are my delight. Anybody here <clears throat> in the last 10 years had any trouble? <clears throat> any at all? <clears throat> Some of you are not raising your hand because you can't get it up. <clears throat> We've all had trouble. We've all had times of anguish. Maybe it was last week. The only thing that constant, the only thing that we can settle in on is God's Word. Psalmist says, all the trouble, all the anguish, everything is, draws me and pushes me to the wonder, wonder of God's Word. 
and the greatness of God's Word because it's real. It's the only stable influence we'll ever have that we can put our hands on and we can read and it gives us instruction and helps us through each day. Trouble and anguish are no match for the magnificence of God's Word. That's what the psalmist says. Now, the psalmist ends with verse 144, and it is a something that reminds us that we have to relinquish who we are and what we have and where we live. The righteousness of your testimony is everlasting. Give me understanding, and I shall live. Yesterday, at vacation Bible school, and at the end of that vacation Bible school, we gave a gospel presentation. Pretty simple. I used a little banjo cue and explained why we need salvation and how we could get salvation. Now, we didn't have hundreds of people. We've had vacation Bible schools at other churches, and here we've had 100, 200 people, 200 kids. I think we had 9 or 10 yesterday. Part of it was the COVID, part, part of it was definitely the COVID because the Hispanic children didn't come because they were exposed to COVID-19. And, and based on the world's way of looking at things, it was not really that successful. And, and we <clears throat> did, some, did a skit, and the actors were not all that good, especially the king. But the bottom line is this. Two of those, for the first time, expressed a desire to surrender their lives to Christ. Now, we may not see them. They, they go to different churches. They're not in this area. We may not ever see the results of that, but it's not important. What's important is that's two people that had the opportunity to get into the kingdom of God for eternity because they began to understand from the program from the beginning to the end, it was all focused on God. It was all focused on the Lord Jesus. And they began to understand what it meant to relinquish their self, to relinquish their control of their self, and surrender their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what's important. That's what's important in every area and every aspect of what we're doing. Now, I don't know how many people are up in this worship service for homeless today. We don't know. They may have gone out to where those people were, and they all, or not all of them, several of them said, if you'll come pick us up, we'll come. And some of them may come just because they know there's going to be lunch afterwards. And that's fine, too. Let me remind you, it's not sometimes what people think they're going to get that they get. But it's what they truly get, and that's the Word of God. And if there's one or two, and one or two gets saved and changes their life, that's wonderful. But if there's 15 and nobody makes the decision, but the gospel is preached and taught, it's a success. You see, it's not success depending on the results. The success is in sharing what God has told us to share. So 1 Peter 1, 23 said, Having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible, through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. This is incorruptible. It cannot be corrupted because it's God's word. In Matthew 5, 20, Jesus said, But I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. And Paul writes to the Romans, in Romans 3.10, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Let me remind you, Nicodemus 
came to Jesus by night. Nicodemus, if you would have gone to the community and said, y'all think Nicodemus is going to go to heaven? Oh, absolutely. He's the most righteous man in Jerusalem. <clears throat> when he walks by, everybody says, man, I wish I could be like Nicodemus. What a man of God. <clears throat> but Jesus said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. Why did Nicodemus need to be born again? Because he was a sinner. He was lost. Romans 10, verses 1 through 3 says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for you, for Israel, is that they may be saved. For I hear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And that word could better be translated, not according to understanding. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. That's where that word surrender comes in. Submitting to the righteousness of God. Submitting to God's word. Saying, God, I, I don't have any agenda. I just want to serve you. I belong to you. You've rescued me. You've given me life eternal. So just tell me what to do. And finally, in 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Paul says to the church at Corinth, For he hath made him who knew no sin, that's Jesus, to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And I think maybe more precisely, the righteousness of God in us. You see, we're not righteous in our own strength. We, we can't do that. We can be better than we were yesterday. Maybe not as good today as we will be tomorrow as we're sanctified. But we will not be righteous in our own strength. The righteousness will only be the righteousness that lives within us. The Holy Spirit living within us brings us righteousness. I want to ask you this morning, how righteous are you? If you say, I'm very righteous. Well, if that's true, it better be because Christ is living in you. Not because you've been able to do it, because that makes you arrogant, self-centered, and a liar. Do you know, without question, that Christ is Lord of your life? Do you get up every morning and say, Lord, uh, whatever your agenda is, just tell me. And what part of it you want me to play, send me out to do it. It may be he sends you out every day to work to be a witness for him. He may tell you to do something, something else. I've told multiple people, some people have said, well, why are you retiring? Only one reason. God said it's time. Not because I want to. Not because this is not a wonderful place to be the pastor. It is. But God said it's time. That's the reason that you and I need to do everything we do. It's because God says to do it. I've been asked, what am I going to do? Whatever Jesus tells me, and then after he does, if, if i got time, whatever Paul tells me. But the reality is, surrender is what we have to do. If we're not surrendered, we're going to be in deep, deep trouble. Let me ask you to stand with me this morning. I'm going to pray, and then uh, Sheila's just going to play softly. No distractions, no concerns about anything but focusing on the Lord Jesus Christ. After I pray, you're going to have the opportunity to come down and deal with him, whatever you need to deal with him about. Not deal with me, not confess anything to me, come to confess to him. Father, as we stand before you, Lord, we're reminded that you are a, a loving, awesome God. You're a righteous God. You're just. But you're also a merciful God. And all you ask of us is all. All you require of us is everything. And so, Father, as we stand before you, as, as we ponder what you said to our hearts today, we pray that 
our hearts would be attuned to you and be willing to do what you've told us to do and how you've told us to do it in every area of our lives. And Father, we'll give you any praise and glory that comes from all this because you deserve it. We don't deserve it. You do. And Father, we thank you again for the reality of your word, but more importantly, the reality that is you. We ask all this in that precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. Let me ask you to keep your heads bowed and eyes closed. As Sheila plays, you respond.